Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to worship today. It is a good day to praise and give glory to God. Now, as we worship today, we're mindful that this is the season of generosity. And as we worship, I wonder if you can think of a few things that you're thankful for. This week poses some new challenges for us, but certainly we give God thanks. So today as we worship, will you join me as we pray? God, thank you for your generosity toward us, for your great love toward us. We would ask God that in this day, we would see a little more of your presence, we would sense it, and we would uh, find that you to be a comforter to us in all things. So, Lord, we give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ. Amen. As we worship today, we're going to begin our worship service with singing, I love to tell the story. Join me as we sing. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of jesus and his glory of jesus and his love i love to tell the story because i know it is true it satisfies my longing as nothing else will do i love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of jesus and his love i love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams i love to tell the story it did so much for me and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story it is pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, it will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest and when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song it will be the old, old story that I have loved so long I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and 
His love. morning happy Sunday Psalm 123 I lift my eyes up to you to you whose throne is in heaven as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master as the eyes of the maid look to the hand of her mistress so our eyes look to you Lord our God though he shows us his mercy have mercy on us O Lord have mercy on us for we have endured much contempt we have endured much ridicule from the proud much contempt from the arrogant. Amen. So you see me standing in front of the New York Stock Exchange, and that is because of our parable today. The parable comes from Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, and we're talking about investment. Jesus says, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents, it's, you know, a dollar, something like that. He came to the master and he said, uh, he, I, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I, I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a pretty bold parable, isn't it? Especially when you get to the end. Um, Jesus has some tough words here in Matthew's Gospel, but it serves a point. It's a picture of the Kingdom of Heaven again, and this time it takes uh, takes this form. You remember the parable of the bridesmaids last week, and the parable of the talents speak to us about the responsibility of the church in between the arrival and the second arrival of the risen Christ. 
The community of the faithful must certainly use all of its resources and grab a little more of that oil, the anointing of God's Holy Spirit, that allows the church to operate in the fullness of faith and love. We plan, as individuals and as a church, to nurture the patterns of faith and love that will be ready to keep uh, the lamps lit so as to really be the light of the world and avoid uh, the difficult description of becoming a lamp hidden underneath a bushel. I mean, will our witness to the coming bridegroom made clear in the light of our witness and abundant with the resources of God's Spirit make a difference as we wait? But the parable of the talents here, and, and then, as we have seen over and over again in Matthew's Gospel with the third parable, the one with the sheep and the goats, describes the reality for the church of living in between the time of Jesus' arrival and the final vindication of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when He shall come in final victory. The church has received different resources, it would appear. Is that the point that Jesus makes between the one, the two, and the five talents? I mean, is this a regional difference? Do the, do each church gets a different amount? The parable describes the actions of the responsible ones and the, and the actions of the inexcusable one. You see, two of them invest, and one buries what he has been given, buries it in a hole. Who knew that Jesus would give investment advice in Matthew's Gospel? How long do we keep our funds in diversified accounts? Is real estate a good investment? Do I have an investment ready for you in the commodity markets of Madagascar? Oh, there's a run on bat guano in the fertilizer markets of Luxembourg. You have to look up bat guano later. Jesus isn't giving investment advice, though. He is not offering, and he's offering a, a, a different picture of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like, or what it does, in fact, look like. Jesus doesn't reward the investment progress of the three, and the one who has two talents and gets two is given the same accolades as the one who has received five and gains five. Chaz Palminteri's movie is play that a Bronx tale. He says, there's nothing so sad as wasted talent. And that line haunts me, not because I'm super talented, that's not the point. It's because I'm always trying to work harder or smarter. I don't want to waste the moment. And you just never know. I think the message of Matthew's Gospel focuses on the point. Don't waste what God has so richly given, the resources of God's Son and the Spirit, the time that remains for us, and the prospect of the return of the Lord motivate me and resource me to work toward a return on God's investment. That's the point. We have to plan for it. Last week we were planning at a wedding uh, for a celebration and we were considering how we take steps in our discipleship to prepare us for the bridegroom's arrival. This week we look at, it, at what it means to plan and invest for what God has made in God's church in the world. And we also look to invest in what God has given so richly in our lives as Christians. God has given His Son the gospel, and the spirit for such a time as this and forever a time like we live. For God so loved the world that God gave, God gave and gave and gave. God has given us what we needed and God has given us the gift that we needed so we might place our trust in Him. There's nothing left for God to give. God has emptied God's self in God's giving. And this separates the living and the true God from all the false ones. Our God leaves nothing to chance and nothing left over. When God gives, God does so in the nature of pure gift. There's no transaction that God expects. We're not you know, placed in a position to do anything so as to deserve this gift. And there's nothing we have to do in receipt of that gift apart from describing that gift to those who have yet to acknowledge it. The act of witness is made possible through the other gift that God has made and has given to the church as we live in between the times. That's the spirit that enlivens our witness, makes it strong, and is its own validation. Matthew's Gospel, remember, gives us that word when it says we, don't, we won't even have to think about the right answer when we're dragged in front of a persecutor. The spirit that God has given will give us the right words to say.
There are times, of course, when the church forgets that all that has been given is all that we need. We try to add to Christ with something like our cleverness, uh, perhaps the advertisement to some sort of experience or another, but that is not for us to say. Jesus is enough. The Spirit is enough. God has given all of God's self to God's church. Notice that the Master is present and then leaves. What does that mean? It means that God has consecrated our time, such as, it, such as it is, to the holy business of witness. What an incredible thing to recognize that we live between the ministry of Jesus and the second advent, the second arrival of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who with the church will participate in the redemption of all things, the reconciliation of all things, and the recreation of all things. But we recognize that God has therefore consecrated our time. This is not throwaway time. We're not going to tank the season in an effort to get a better selection in the draft. Instead, we acknowledge that this time, it's strange, it's broken, it's as difficult as it is, but it has been sanctified by God and is a small part of God's incredible purposes for God's world. This means something that has value right now. You've seen a lot of people talking about the cultural, political dynamics of this earthquake or that flood or this forest fire, that God's coming back, or that we should just wait till heaven arrives. You know, we're responsible. I'm responsible with the gifts of God given to me, God's only Son, and God's life-giving Spirit. And when I bury my talent in the ground and just wait for the Master to arrive, whether I am melancholy or scared to death, I have no warrant to become despondent about this time. This time, the time in which I live, the time where I enjoy my family and work at a task, the time where I laugh and cry and curse and celebrate, all of this time has been consecrated and sanctified by God so as to help me to envision the sacred worth of my life and your life. I am challenged to see things, events, times, relationships, not as stepping stones to something else, something bigger and better, but to see all persons, times, and events as opportunities for God's blessing and grace. As the church, as members of the church, we dare not throw away our minutes or our talents. They are God-given. Cherish them. We've learned with so much difficulty, too, that our times are fleeting and short and that God grants us just a bit of God's grace that we might enjoy our times, participate in the redemption of our time, and that we might bring faith and love, hope, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and holiness to bear upon our time. We do so as bearers of the message of the gospel and in the power of the Spirit. I plan to use the moments given to me. I plan to describe the good news of God for this time, as strange as it is. I plan to talk of the kingdom of God as something that has come in some measure and to push back on the idea that all we have is heaven and we're just going to wait for that in a distant eternity. Sure, we have heaven, but we have now. We have now to turn hatred to love, selfishness to generosity, and despair to hope through the message of the gospel and the presence of God's Spirit. Now that last slave, the one who does nothing, the Christian who does nothing, the church that does nothing, it's not just apathetic, lazy, or unprofitably dumb. The Christian church or the church that does nothing is lazy and wicked. Matthew's gospel surprises us with the harshness of the verdict. The church is to exist as a risk-taking body that in invests in the mission of sharing the gospel. What are the bare bones of that message? What of the message that God has overcome our hatred, sin, selfishness, and rebellion? By doing the impossible, God has overcome our no with God's yes in Jesus. Without our vote, while we were sinful, God came and gave. The Father sent the Son, and the Son gave Himself up for us in sacrifice, and so sent to us the Spirit. We cannot do nothing with that news. On the cross, Jesus has done the impossible. Jesus has overcome the world, and we've been given the task 
a real task in the real world of trying to describe this gift to those that Jesus himself describes as blind to the reality of God's grace, hardened to the softness of God's mercies, and immune to the language of unconditional love, fueled by self-interest. But that is our task. And we're not given the time limit. Remember in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. And then God says uh, to, the, to the prophet, You've got to do that until every, uh, everybody uh, refuses you. But God's yes overcomes every single no. There is no addiction, no evil, no sin, no disease, no hatred that God's yes in Christ has not and will not overcome and overwhelm in the time and grace of God's plans and purposes. God, the Lord of time, the faithful one, expects to see something of our efforts, our witness, and our use of the gospel and the spirit. When I speak of our efforts, I'm not envisioning the return of the master accompanied by my description of my guitar playing or movie production. Just that thought makes me cringe. Can you imagine the Lord asking me why I can't keep my guitar in tune? Now, we don't take the risk in our mission or in our witness through the form of our witness, but with our message. And we make a decision that the longer, and the longer I sit with the decision, the happier I am with it. Although, I admit, there don't seem many that follow the path that, uh, that I kind of picked. And that decision is to be a witness to the good news about what God has done in the world. Thereby, I try to resist the temptation to express all of the fancy things that I think must be done by frail and feeble hands through mixed and pure motivations and through mixed methods. So the risk that we take, the risk is to stick to the message of the cross. I resist the idea that there is anything that I got to add to what God saw fit to answer once and for all. What a challenge that is for us uh, who like gimmicks and guitars and all the other stuff. All the forms for our witness, the church seeks to simply stick to the message of the cross and the overcoming love of God in Christ for the world while opposing all those little isms and things that offer cooperative voices to the gospel. As Paul says in Galatians, there is no other gospel. Even if an angel falls out of heaven uh, and tells you a different message, there is no message, and so we stick to that one. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. See, that is a significant risk. The risk is to stay firm on that message and not to add to or subtract from with all of the different competitive voices in our world, Jesus challenges us to take the risk of just expressing and describing God's goodness and God's grace, God's love and God's mercy. And that's the investment that in the parable returns double what you invest in it. I wonder here as we celebrate in this worship service, how can you describe God's gift to somebody? How can the church become a better bearer of this good news? A better conduit for God's Spirit? Well, if you have ideas about that, I would love to hear them. For that is our call and that is our purpose as a church at large and as individuals of it. And so uh, I would invite you to partner with me in that great investment. Amen. Today, as we close our worship service, please be in prayer for one another. I am very mindful that we have uh, an, uh, a situation developing that might be difficult for us. I can definitely envision uh, a more stringent set of guidelines in the wake of cases that continue to rise. Please be patient. Seek the Lord's face. Try as best as you can to stay on that. I know that that's what I'm trying to do. That's the only thing I can encourage you to do. Pray for one another. Pray for me. Pray for those who uh, are, are doing their best and uh, coming. We're keeping everything as safe as we can as we worship. Uh, remember those who are uh, sick and trying to recover. Um, there are posts in our church page 
uh, and, and the group page where concerns can be voiced. But we're going to say a prayer and then the Lord's Prayer as we close our worship service. Lord, here we are. And we are tempted, Lord, to add a little something to the Gospel. Maybe we will add a little leadership style to it, or maybe we'll add um, this kind of application in terms of life experiences to it. But there is no other message than the one that you share. The one where your yes overcomes any of our no. And God, we ask that today that you would remind us of your goodness and your grace so as to help us to describe that gift to a world that probably can't describe it rightly. I pray, Lord, for those who are not well. I pray for healing. I pray for wholeness. I ask that you would comfort the hearts of those who grieve today. Be with those who are, are sick. There are several that I know of who are battling COVID, several who are grieving today. I pray, God, that you would pour out your Spirit upon us, that you would heal, guide, direct, restore. To the brokenhearted, give courage and comfort. To the weak, we pray that you would give strength. In all things, Lord, we look to you with thanks and praise. For you are the one who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship. As we close our worship service, we're going to, uh, there's going to be a song that comes next, Arms of Love. So if you can stick around for that, if that encourages you, uh, stick around for that. Thank you again for joining us in worship. God bless you. song of love to my Savior to my Jesus I'm grateful for the things you've done my loving Savior oh precious Jesus my heart is glad that you've called me your own there's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. In your arms of love. Holding me still, holding me near in your arms of love. I sing a simple song of love to my Savior to my Jesus I'm grateful for the things you've done my loving Savior oh precious Jesus my heart is glad that you've called me your own there's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love, in your arms of love, holding me still, holding me near, in your arms of love, in your arms in your arms of love holding me still holding me near in your arms of love